Hey everyone, so I just wanted to get on here to share with you a testimony. I think this is going to be really beneficial. Somebody's going to hear this today and the sword of the spirit is going to pierce you straight through. Um, I have no doubt. So uh, I know someone, he's, he's not a blood relative, but I do consider him like family and I love him and I care for him. And um, I was actually present at his baptism, which was amazing. And I remember how excited he was that day to um, start this new journey with the Lord. And he was ready to give it his all. And I remember he was always studying to show his self-approved. And he, um, he was well-versed in the Bible. And, and as far as I knew, he was growing in his walk. You know, he would message me from time to time and share a word that he had listened to. And I, I just knew, you know, great things were going to happen for him. He has some amazing gifts. Um, he has these incredible visions. And he's been having them since he was a child. Now, I probably didn't see him for a little over a year. And then we recently came into contact again. And the first time that I saw him, just upon looking at him, I knew something was horribly wrong. I had the discernment to know that something had changed in him. There was a hardening of his heart. The, the life had literally been drained right out of his face. It looked like his hope had been suffocated. Even the way his countenance, the way he was carrying himself, his, his, his body and everything, how he just kind of hung his head and didn't make a whole lot of eye contact was telling me something's horribly wrong. So as I was talking to him and we were having a conversation and I was trying to figure out what had been going on in his life, uh, since the last time we spoke, we sat at his uh, kitchen table doing a uh, Bible study. And he's very well versed in the Bible. He's actually got uh, the ability to teach. Um, and so I, I, I was enjoying listening to some of his insights. However, again, I was still trying to figure out what is going on with him, what has changed, and whether or not he could pinpoint when it changed, because he acknowledged that his hope had not only diminished, but it was, it was being suffocated. And so as I was talking to him, he started to tell me that, you know, he thought that he had spoken tongues once, but he didn't. And, and then he was telling me that you know, he, he's not even sure if he's saved. And all of these things were bothersome to me. Then about a, a week later, we went to church. And it was, it was an amazing service. It was an amazing service. I received some deliverance that night. Um, and I remember after the deliverance, I looked over to my right. And he was just sitting next to me, and, and he had his head in his hands. And at first, I thought he was praying, so I didn't want to interrupt him. But then I noticed that he was just broken. He was just so broken. And so I started a conversation, and I just said, hey, what's what's been going on with you? And he proceeded to tell me that he had a dream where God told him that he wasn't saved. Now, when he first said that, I rejected it with everything in me. I started to quote scripture as to why he is saved. Because if you they that call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. And if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Hallelujah. And that we are saved by grace through faith and not any works of our own, lest any man could boast. And I went through all of this and I could see him just saying to me, no, no, you don't, you don't understand. You don't understand. But I did see a little bit of hope start to rise up into him that 
it wasn't over for him yet. There was a possibility that he could get back to the place where he was. So he proceeded to tell me that he had a vision. And he had a vision where he was seated with Christ in heavenly places, right? And he literally came out of his body in the spirit and he could feel himself drop, he said, from grace. Again, this was bothersome to me and I didn't feel right about it, but he was explaining the experience. And so I just let him talk. I just let him get it out. And he said, I became very prideful, Angela. I became really prideful, little too self-righteous. And he said, and I know that haughtiness comes before a fall. Pride comes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. And I agreed with him and I said, you know, it, it's, um, it's a very humbling experience when we find out that we've entered into a prideful, high-minded, haughty, arrogant, egotistical place and the Lord has to humble us, but his rebuke and his reproof and his cre uh, correction is always done in love. So I'm still listening to him go on and on about this and I can clearly hear him say that he does not think he is saved. And I was resi resisting it with everything in me. So on the way home in the car, there was this amazing thing that took place. So as we were talking, and I don't even know what I said, I just know that the sword of the spirit came out of my mouth and pierced him straight through the heart. I just know that he had a revelation in the car. I just know that all of a sudden that cloud of deception, that veil that had come over him, had loosed him and let him go in a moment. And he said, I got it. I think I, I understand what happened to me now. And I said, what do you think happened to you? And he said, I was trying to save myself. I thought that I was, I was good on my own. I became so prideful that I thought that I could attain my own salvation. He said, I became religious. He said, I became like a Pharisee. And if you know anything about the Bible, the Pharisees were religious leaders. The Pharisees grew up on religion and tradition and things being a certain way. So they really didn't like when Jesus came and started doing these unconventional things that were so against the laws that they had been brought up on. And so they, they rebelled against it and they rejected it completely. They wanted no part of this new thing that was emerging across the land when Jesus' ministry started blowing up and people were following him, multitudes of people being healed, set free, and delivered. So as he has this revelation, he proceeds to tell me that he got saved when he was three. Now, then, this is when it all came together for me. This is when it all started to make sense. His dream where the Lord literally said, and, and it might have been a vision, I'm sorry, where the Lord literally told him that he was not saved. Now, some people may disagree with me here, but a three-year-old does not have the capacity to grasp or understand the commitment that is being made when they call upon the name of the Lord and ask him to come in and change everything about them and their life and to forgive them of their sins and to cleanse them of all unrighteousness and to create in them a clean heart. They, they, they can't even understand what salvation means or atonement means or justification means. 
or grace or faith on any of it. So when he told me that, the Holy Spirit put it on my heart to have him call upon him the right way. And so he considered it a rededication and, and that's fine because he felt like he already did it when he was three. But really what he was doing was he was inviting the Lord in for the very first time where he could acknowledge and understand the commitment that he's entering into and fully fathom what it means when he reads words like deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me and fully understand the meaning of repentance and the meaning of bearing good fruit. He can fully grasp those things. So I, I was so excited for him because finally he had called upon the Lord and he believes with everything in him. Everything the scripture says. He believes it's in the in, infallible word of God. And this, this person is going to go on to do great and mighty things. For the Lord, I have no doubt. But I wanted to read this verse to you. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 23. And I'm going to be re reading from the English Standard Version. Chapter 23, Jeremiah verse 29. Just that one verse. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. See, we're, we're told in the Bible that we need a new heart. We need a new heart, not just because our heart is deceitful and wicked, but we need a new heart because we have hearts of stone. We have hearts of pride. We have hearts of stubbornness. We have hearts of rebellion. We have the kind of heart where you cannot correct us, where we won't receive correction because we know better than everyone else how we should conduct our lives. His word is like a hammer that breaks our hard-hearted rebellion. In pieces. In pieces. And the word is also the sword of the spirit. A double-edged sword. And when that double-edged sword hits you straight through the heart, it hurts. When that double-edged sword hits you straight through the heart, it hurts. It hurts, but then it heals. We need to welcome conviction. We need to welcome rebuke. We need to welcome reprove. We need to welcome correction. It does not matter who it's coming from. It does not matter whether or not you think that you're being persecuted or attacked. You need to read through the lines. You need to pay attention to replies and responses, whether it's coming from an unbeliever or not, and take it into consideration and Pray about it and take it back to the Lord and ask him, is there any truth in what they said? Because if God can speak through a donkey like he did to Balaam, he can speak through anyone. Okay, but we don't want to be so hard-hearted and stubborn that we think, that we've reached some kind of plateau of spirituality where we're not going to receive a word of instruction or correction from somebody because they don't have a close and personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because that's far from the truth. The Lord can speak through anyone, anywhere, anytime. He can use them. And he's in full control. So sometimes 
yes, we have become prideful, we have become haughty, we have become high-minded, we have become arrogant, we have become self-righteous, and the Lord needs to humble us a bit. And I will tell you this, it hurts. It's supposed to hurt. If you are going to a church and you sit in your seat day in and day out, every Saturday or Sunday, depending on when your church has service, and you don't get convicted to the point where you're uncomfortable and squirming in your seat, there's a problem. We don't grow by having cozy, comfortable messages. There's nothing cozy and comfortable about the gospel. Yes, it is good news. However, we have to preach this whole thing, not the watered down version not the sugar-coated version. No, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And the truth hurts. The truth hurts when it's spoken. Because you have to self-reflect. You have to take a good look at you. There's nowhere where you can run and hide in that moment. It's just you and God. And he's saying, I need you. To pay close attention. I need you to not run away from this. I need you to hear it. I need you to receive it. But how many of us know that our immediate reaction to anyone's correction, rebuke, or reproof is to run the other way, is to cover our ears? They who have ears to hear, let, let them hear. So I'm going to share another testimony with you. I was in prayer today. And the Lord keeps on putting the same family member on my heart. I can see her face clearly in a vision. And he's telling me that even though I think that I have fully forgiven this person, I still, from time to time, bring up things that have happened between us in the past where I felt slighted, betrayed, hurt, disappointed. And so as I was praying, the Holy Ghost just jumped on me. Literally just jumped on me. And my voice was trembling. And the tears were just pouring down my face. Now, I just had a, a recent half conversation with this person that I haven't spoken to in a while, and, and I keep trying to reach out, but the fact of the matter is they don't believe, and I do, and I just want to talk about Jesus, and she's not trying to hear it, and I just want to talk about the, the amazing things that are happening in my life or maybe even to warn her of some of the prophetic words so that she can be equipped or <laughs> run, you know, to the feet of the cross. But how many of us know that you cannot force somebody? You cannot force somebody. You cannot beat them over the head with the Bible. That's not how it works. The Father draws us to him the father draws us to him so that i can i can plant seeds all day and somebody else will water that seed but god is the one who is going to make things grow but because i know the the times that we're in and, and i know we're in the last days and i and i know that spiritual attacks are heightening and i know some of the things that are about to come upon this nation i was just in this desperate place so when she reached out to me all i wanted to do was warn her and say hey wake up they who have ears to hear let them hear you are deceived and the lord rebuked me and the Lord reminded me that this person, this family member of mine, has never known a healthy love a day in her life. And the few times 
that I could have shown her the love of Christ. I was more concerned with her salvation in a frantic and desperate attempt to get her attention, to get her to see how she has been deceived and to give Jesus a try, but all she really needed from me. All she really needed from me was to meet with him, was to see his love and his compassion and his mercy and his kindness and his goodness and his faithfulness through me. And I wasted the opportunities where she reached out in a frantic attempt to save her soul. But that's not what she needed. She didn't need to be beat over the head with the Bible. She needed the light of the world to shine in the midst of her darkness. <laughs> she needed the glory of the Lord to break through her hopelessness and despair. I said, Lord, please forgive me. I love her and I want her to know your love. I want her to know your compassion. I don't want that to be withheld from her because I got in the way. Yes, I want her to be saved. But she needs to know she is loved. Cared for, appreciated, approved of, accepted, adored. I also realized that I haven't prayed for her half as much as the rest of my family members. And I had the authority to intercede and do great and mighty things because of who I belong to. I want to ask you today, and I want you to be honest with yourself. Are you fighting on your knees and in prayer for everyone in your generational line, not just the people you're on in good standing with and in good terms, but the ones that you were bearing grudges against, the ones who hurt and harmed you, the ones who betrayed your trust, the ones who lied on you and falsely accused you because they need love too. They need love more. They need it more. And we should not deny them of that. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. We should want mercy for them. We should want them to experience God's loving kindness and his steadfast love. His mercy that endures forever. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of wickedness in heavenly places. And there is a soul in there who desperately needs not always just to be ministered to, but just to be seen and acknowledged. 
loved and cared for. Free from judgment. Free from our pointless assessments and our opinions. I pray that you will take inventory of your heart today. You will take this back to the Lord. And you will ask him if there's anybody who you have been withholding prayer for because maybe you're not as close because maybe you've drifted apart because maybe there's a part of you that still has not forgiven them. I pray that you would make amends with that person I pray that you would make it a point to show them the love of Christ because tomorrow is not promised and life is like a vapor. And we don't know how many opportunities we're going to have to show them Jesus. <laughs>